Are you as passionate about local governance and municipal issues as I am? Well, then the Cross Border Interviews is your show. We are here to provide you with exclusive insights and thought provoking conversations focusing on municipal matters from across Canada. And now, you have the chance to be part of our incredible journey. By backing our show for as little as $3 per month, you can help us grow and bring more exciting content to your ears. Now, you might be asking yourself, what sets the cross-border interviews apart from other shows? Well, we're not your average show. We dive deep into the unique challenges, successes, and innovative solutions of municipalities from across Canada. We bring you unbiased, unfiltered conversations about municipal issues from coast to coast to coast. By supporting our show, you become an essential part of our mission to amplify the voices of local leaders and shed light on the issues that matter most to our communities. Together, we can foster meaningful change and create stronger, more vibrant communities within our great country. Simply visit our website at crossborderinterviews.ca and show your support today. No matter how small, your contribution makes a significant difference and allows us to continue producing great shows, like the one you're about to hear. Together, let's make municipal issues matter again. Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. Over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we are honored to have as our 599th guest from the city of Vancouver, British Columbia, Councillor Lisa Dominato. Hopefully I pronounced that right. Lisa, welcome to the show. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me on. Yes, Lisa Dominato from the city of Vancouver. Dominato. Nice to be here. <laughs> well, I appreciate so, you taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. So I want to jump right into the uh, the questions here. And I want to start with the question I've asked every single municipal politician who has ever come on this show. So you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Well, I love that question, Chris. Um, and it really hits close to heart, my heart. Um, it actually started with my dad. And I, I probably, I don't know what other people have said, but um, when I was growing up, my dad was a stay-at-home dad, a bit non-traditional in the 70s. And my mom went off to work. And um, and uh, in staying home and raising my brother and I, he got really involved in community. That was really important to him. And so he volunteered for a whole variety of not-for-profits, uh, service agencies, uh, Kiwanis Club, uh, organizations that hosted food banks. And so growing up, um, after school, I got trucked along to board meetings. That was my immersion into um, service was my dad would go to these not-for-profits and he was either a board chair or the secretary treasurer. And, um, and so that was a big part of my upbringing is seeing my dad in service. And he had no desire to run for public office, but he did believe in community. He did give, believe in volunteerism and giving back. And he also believed in the democratic process. And so he volunteered on political campaigns as well at the civic, provincial, and federal levels. And uh, in service of people he thought were um, uh, would be great candidates and, and great leaders in community. And so that was the other part of my experience. So that's where my sense of, of duty really comes from. And then um, as a young person, uh, both in high school and then through university and into my professional life, I got involved volunteering. And so I served on a number of boards, uh, the Kiwanis Club of Victoria, but also in Vancouver, um, a not-for-profit, a couple of them, but one specifically that supports people with mental illness uh, and substance use disorders and, and housing called the Kettle Society. And so um, really a lot of it stems from um, that desire to help uh, and to really make a difference in people's lives. And I think that's, uh, we can do it all different ways. Uh, some of it's in elected office, some of it's through the volunteers and work that my dad did and I did earlier. 
So in 2017, because I, I try to do a, as little bit of research on my guest as possible, because I want my uh, my listeners and my viewers to learn about the guest from them instead of me just asking the traditional questions. But in 2017, you put your name forward for the Vancouver School Board trustee, and you get elected in 2017. And then in 2018, you make the jump into municipal city governance, which is uh, uh, the municipal election in the city of Vancouver. I want to know what was going on at that time. What made you finally say, this is the time? This is the time that Lisa's name is going to be put forward. And this is the time that I believe my voice, my passion, my understanding of what's going on in our city is going to help at the school board level, but also at the city level in 2018. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, uh, prior to running, I had spent um, a decade working in the BC legislature and then another almost decade working in the public service for the provincial government. But at that time in 2017, uh, I was raising a young family. So my kids were probably maybe three and five. Um, and my so my eldest had just started school. And in Vancouver, the con you know, the situation at that time was the Vancouver School Board had been fired uh, by the provincial government, uh, the entire board over issues and allegations of bullying and interference by the board with staff. And, and I actually still remember the moment I'm, I'm, I'm at home with my kids, I'm doing the dishes one evening, I'm bantering with my husband about what's going on in the city, the board's just been fired. And I said, you know, after all the years of my experience of working, I worked in K-12 education in that sector, having done board governance, I was like, surely I can do this role. I could take this on and lean in and, and contribute in a positive and meaningful way to our education system. And that was the beginning of a journey of saying, you know, okay, things haven't been working. So how can I contribute and how can I make a difference and, um, and put my name on a ballot? And then I really leaned into that role over the course of the next year. And what I found was increasingly my interactions with people were like, you're doing a great job. You should maybe get more involved. And hey, there's a there's a civic elections coming up in you know a few months. Have you considered running for council? And so people started asking me. I hadn't thought about it yet, but um, and uh, and I've been very passionate about issues around housing and homelessness and climate issues and civic governance. So it seemed a natural fit to dip my toe in. And so, and here I find myself. You talk about uh, the sort of the local aspect of the job. And, and I, I, I quote Scott Pierce a lot on this show, the president of FCM. And I'm pretty sure he's going to start asking for royalties every time I use his term. But local governance is the governance of proximity. It is. And he he said it so bad. He said it best at the FCM conference in Toronto this year. And you make the diff most difference in day-to-day -day lives of people. The decisions you make are impacted the day after, not like the provincial government where it could take a few weeks or even a month or even a year. Federal government, not as much, maybe t a year, 10 years. But locally, you make the biggest difference. How has that responsibility been for you to weigh the, the pros and cons and the decisions you make on at that council table to ensure that you're doing it right and not impacting people in a negative way when you make decisions? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a great question. And, and I, I wholeheartedly agree with Scott. I mean, the, the proximity, you're, you're, you're closest to the issues that really make a difference in people's everyday lives. Uh, and for those of us who are on elected councils, we take that seriously. I, I actually love uh, what I call the constituency work of uh, working with residents, trying to navigate city hall, trying to navigate government processes, because um, it can be a bit overwhelming if you're a resident and you're wanting to have your voice heard, or you're simply wanting to do a basic task of what we talk a lot about in, in the city is you want to redevelop, you want to add some housing density to your lot for intergenerational homes. Um, and so I help a lot with residents trying to deal with permitting and licensing and in small businesses. Um, but it's really rewarding um, and trying to connect people to, to make the appropriate connections. But there certainly is a balance of hearing from residents and their individual concerns and then balancing that with but the bigger picture, like the, you know, uh, what's going to serve the, you know, the, the great number of people in, a, in the long term. And so, for example, you're, you're, you're about to quote Spock from Star Trek. That's my favorite quote. The good, the what's good for the better. Uh, uh, how do you outweigh the good of the many with the needs of the few or something like that? And it I can is, imagine. It's in that vein. You're exactly right. That's in that vein. Um, and so, and, and it comes up a lot. I'll just say a, a prime example of this is in the context of housing. 
Uh, we know we have a lack of housing supply. And then when we have applications that come to rezoning at council, which I'll be doing a public hearing this afternoon, um, we often get a, a small number of residents who happen to be in proximity near um, those developments and they have concerns. They have concerns about the change, what, Im what impact it's gonna have on their neighborhood, what it's gonna look like. And, and you have to weigh that input with um, the fact that we are a growing city, we have increasing numbers of people coming and, and immigrating to our, our, our country, into our city, and the fact that we have a broader housing crisis at play. And so it's a delicate balance, um, but I, I know that most councils think really weigh those considerations seriously, and, and I love that part of the work. Is it easy? Is it easy to balance the needs of the many with the needs of the few? Because you, we can't forget about the few, right? As an elected official, you have to represent everyone. You can't just look at your street or your area of your city, but you have to look at everyone. But there's some times when you have to look at the individual person, do you not? I, I would agree. And I would say, in answer to your question, no, it's <laughs> it's not easy. Um, it's it's not easy because there's many voices, there's very diverse voices. That's the other thing that I have always kept in mind because we do um, in Vancouver, we don't have a ward system. And so we have a, a very dominant uh, party or electoral organization system. And so um, what I keep on at the forefront of my mind is that while I may have run with an organization, I may have run with a party and there may have been a platform um, that once you're elected, you have a duty to represent everyone and that entire continuum and spectrum of residents and so it's uh it's certainly a balance as you note and um but again i think it's really leaning into the role and listening and learning and and being open to different ideas before i turn to the city as a whole i want to ask this question because i find it fascinating especially at the local level your job is in your community. You don't go to Victoria to do your job. You don't go to Ottawa to do your job. You make decisions. You're out and getting groceries that night or going to a concert. Have you found the balance after five years in elected office as a city councillor for public life councillor and private life, Lisa? <laughs> uh, uh, my short answer is no. Um, it's people are like, how do you juggle? How do you do it? And I basically say, it's just messy. I have a family. I have two daughters and I also have a stepdaughter as well, who's an adult. And I've got uh, two cats and a dog and a household. And I have my father living with us as well. I have other, and just there's like many Canadians. I'm not unique in that, um, but it's messy. Um, and I am the kind of person who puts 110% into whatever I take on in life. And so I do that here. I try to attend as many events as possible because it's really important, particularly for the different um, uh, cultural groups and organizations within the city, for us to show up and be present and participate um, in, you know, for example, tomorrow I'll be attending uh, the opening of the very first National Chinese Canadian Museum in the country. And uh, my family's going away today. And I said, no, I'm staying because I want to be there for the community. And so you make choices. Um, but I would say, I don't know that there's a balance. It's just messy. And I do the best I can for both the, the community and for my family. Have you enjoyed it? Have you enjoyed it after five years where you can say the, the, the differences that I make at that council table, I can see the impacts in my community? Absolutely. I love it. It's um, honestly best experience ever. Uh, and uh, would you recommend what? it to people? Absolutely. We actually need more people uh, uh, to step up and, 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 and at whatever level, whether it's school board, uh, council, provincial, federal, uh, we just, we need good people who want to invest the time and bring new ideas and we need the diversity and I, it's just, but um, okay. absolutely. Okay. You, you, you've you've brought up a subject that I am very passionate about is about apathy in this country, the apathetic mm -hmm. nature in this country, especially when it comes to local politics, municipal politics, school board politics is horrendous, in my opinion. This is my opinion. This is not the councillor's opinion. This is my opinion. When you talk to your residents in your city, are they addressing you with more city issues or are they talking provincial issues and federal issues because we're seeing a lot of downloading across this country from other levels of governments onto municipalities so are people when they are asking you about talking to you about their issues are they talking more city issues or are they talking more provincial and federal issues i would say generally i'm i'm getting uh when i speak with residents i hear persons it's on 
everything. So I get everything from, I want a street improvement. I, I'm concerned about speeding near my block. I want to have a roundabout. I want to have, you know, speed humps. I, I want you to deal with traffic issues or a development permit for my property to how are you going to address um, the healthcare shortage. And, you know, I, I was door knocking at a woman who um, had uh, immigrated from uh, Eastern Europe and was struggling to get credentialed here to be a, a, a GP uh, to issues about how you're going to address uh, housing, how you're going to address climate change. Uh, and so I, I would say um, residents don't always distinguish between the different levels of government. They, they really want to see action. And that is the challenge because to your point, have we seen voter apathy? Absolutely. I think we have. Um, and um, in my role, what I try to do is I try to address the, what are the local issues that we can take on? Um, but I also see local councillors as advocates. So while I may not be able to change health policy or climate policy that's done, you know, provincially or federally, I can certainly be a voice for those residents to those different levels. And that's why different levels of government, and that's why relationships are so important that as councillors we're building relationships across the political spectrum, that we're meeting with our MLAs and our MPs and our ministers. And um, because we do have a responsibility to bring forward those issues, even though we may not have direct control over them in our jurisdiction. So I want to ask this question to follow up on that. And I want to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is her opinion. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This may not even be on council's radar right now because there's other things going on. But in your opinion, councillor, as of recording this episode, what is the biggest issue facing the city of Vancouver today? Housing. How Housing do you address that? That's a complicated question. Um, you know, at, at the civic level, one of the things that we've identified as directly within our jurisdiction, within our control, is permitting. Uh, this is something we campaigned on, and the fact that significant delays in, in issuing permits, development and building permits to uh, whether it be a resident trying to do a laneway or a larger scale builder trying to do, you know, a large scale rental or strata developments or co-op housing is we can uh, shrink those timeframes. And by doing that, you can deliver housing more quickly uh, and you it saves costs over time. Um, the other aspect that we can do is we can offer up city land, which we have done in the city of Vancouver, I think has a strong track record of saying, we have city to own land and we're willing to partner with the provincial government and a nonprofit agency to deliver uh, affordable or social housing or supportive housing on that city land because it brings down the cost. You don't have the land costs. Um, and so then you simply need the partners of for the operating. And um, so I would say that is housing and housing affordability uh, and supply continues to be a, a top issue in the city. So I'm going to ask a very, uh, it might be an inappropriate question, but I feel like you, you, you probably had this question asked you a few times. The city of Vancouver is sort of the poster child that politicians from across Canada want to say, you don't want your house prices up like the prices in Vancouver. And do you feel as a council, even as a councillor, that you need to address this issue because federal and provincial and other provincial uh, 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 politicians are using your city to say, it could be worse, look at the house prices in Vancouver? Well, I, I will say that, and, and I, I have heard it provincially, federally, I do tire a little bit of being the poster child on, on these issues. Um, but again, it reinforces for me that we have to work collaboratively across the local, provincial, and federal levels of government to address housing supply and affordability and choice. Uh, and um, the federal government's been leaning back into the housing portfolio, and I, I think that's critical, and so has the provincial government. And, and one of the conversations that's been happening in BC um, has been um, when the how, when the federal government is looking at, at housing funding and transfers to provinces, maybe they should be looking at the immigration trends and where are people pop going to when they're, pop they're coming to Canada they're going to Montreal, they're going to Toronto, they're going to Vancouver, they're going to Calgary. So should housing dollars flow and follow those immigration trends? Should they follow and flow where we're seeing the highest levels of, uh, of homelessness, which is another issue that we're seeing in Vancouver and grappling with. And is along, if you look at the entire coastline of the states uh, where we've had encampments. So I think um, it's integral um, to have uh, a recognition that when we're dealing with housing or homelessness or poverty, 
that we need to have all levels of government working together and it's we can't finger point and yes we still have certain lanes and jurisdictions in certain areas but we have to work together do you get buy-in from the community when you're talking about the needs for housing and more affordable housing? Because I, I speak to municipal councillors, mayors, Reeves, wardens from across Canada, and there's a lot of nimbyism in this country. And I, I'm, I'm not bursting anyone's bubble that says it is strong, particularly in city centres. They don't want uh, affordable housing near our home. They don't want this. They don't want that. Is there buy-in from your community to build these affordable housing so people can access the housing market, but also get into more affordable housing? I think there is generally a buy-in. I think people recognize the critical importance of this because, um, you know, we're hearing that it, that home ownership is increasingly out of reach for, for young people. Uh, they're looking at the, the this level of down payment that's necessary. And, um, and also, um, even if you're looking at home ownership, you're looking at rental, there's a lack of rental supply, there's a lack of social and supportive housing. Um, and so I think there is generally a buy-in, but I do think it varies uh, from neighborhood to neighborhood. Some neighborhoods are accustomed to seeing more density, to seeing uh, more different types of housing. Uh, others have not seen as much change uh, over time. And so uh, back to the point I made earlier, I think that there is a uh, with change comes some fear. And so it's sort of working through that is that, uh, as I said to someone recently, so I have a, a my great uncle, he was um, born in Vancouver and, and died in Vancouver. He was 104 years old. Um, I only hope to live that long. Um, but can you imagine the amount of change that he saw in his lifetime in 104 years? Uh, immense. And so I, I think it's, it's helping bring people along in that conversation and, and recognizing we need dynamic, diverse neighborhoods and communities. And um, But uh, the, the world's changing and we have to change with it. And uh, so we need to make these investments. I want to turn to my last segment because I, I am cautious of time and I know you're a busy counselor and I want to talk about my favorite subject is tourism. I love tourism and I've promised that if you come on the show, I come to your community and spend my economic dollars. I'm looking forward to coming back to Vancouver later in September. I believe the Union of British Columbia Municipalities is hosting their conference there. So I'm going to yes. hopefully be in attendance as well. Great. So counselor for tourists and for people listening from across Canada, what are the hidden gems? We know that we know the typical things that you're going to say, but what are the hidden gems that tourists need to say see in Vancouver when they visit? Wow. Okay, that's a great question. Uh, first of all, I'm just going to say um, uh, I love the fact you brought up tourism because we just had a, a quite a lengthy meeting with Destination Vancouver about the opportunities and how we can work together with a new mandate, new council, and how to promote the city and encourage tourism. So great, and looking forward to you coming in uh, to UBTM. Um, you know, one of the things, and, and maybe this will sound typical, but maybe not. Um, I was asking the Destination Vancouver board about when people are coming here, I know they come here for the nature, they leave you know, the mountains, the oceans. They, so I said, but is there an interest in the cultural, uh, ethno heritage aspects of our city and our region? And I said, I'm curious about that. And their answer was a resounding yes. And I said, I think we need to do more to encourage that type of tourism. And so that when people are coming here, they're coming not only to enjoy you know, the natural assets that we have in the region, but also uh, to learn about our First Nations and meet with them, Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh. Uh, coming into Chinatown, I think you know it's been a great discussion uh, in the last number of months, the revitalization of Chinatown. It's just getting renamed as well, isn't it? Uh, we well, and, uh, we're opening a Chinatown office uh, okay. that will be named yes uh, uh, after Alexander von von Konyal. So that that's coming up. Gastown, an iconic part of the city, many people know as well. Um, but there are other parts of the city, for example, the Punjabi Market on Main Street, uh, which is another area that we've been working with that community. Um, and so, personally, I would like to see us do more around. Uh, recognizing the diverse heritage and ethnocultural uh, uh, heritage of our city and inviting people to experience that. And it's not just about visiting uh, Main Street to see the Punjabi market. It's actually enjoying and experiencing the culture, the food, the people. The, and, and so that for me um, is uh, a big part of coming to Vancouver uh, in addition to all those, you know, the natural assets. I mean, I think we have a beautiful city, a beautiful region, uh, but 
where do you go after a stressful day? After a long day of a council meeting, after a long day of meetings, long day events, is there a pub? Is there a park that you can just go and decompress? Or are you like every other councillor, mayor that I speak to, you just go home to decompress with your family? <laughs> Uh, well, I, I certainly do decompress with my family. Sometimes I also go out with my council colleagues and uh, share a beverage. And uh, but um, you know what? I I personally am. I love the ocean. I like being near the ocean. So I like to be down in, in our parks and our sea walls and areas where I can be close to the ocean. That's a. Um, I grew up in White Rock, and so I was also close to the ocean. So that's a big part for me is decompressing. And so being near water. <laughs> the million dollar question the most important question i will ask every single councillor mayor who's ever come on the show what makes your city so unique mm, the people i think it's the people it's the people that make the city i mean you can build buildings and parks and and um and but it's the people it's the it's the culture um uh, that seems overly simplistic right now, but that's what resonates for me uh, being here because I actually didn't grow up in the city of Vancouver. I grew up in a suburb city of White Rock. And um, for me coming here, the diversity. Um, and I, so for me, it's, um, it's really about the people. That's what makes the community and um, uh, more than anything else. Lisa, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for sitting down for a half hour, taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. Um, I say this with sincerity, and I think this is not said enough to municipal councillors. Thank you for serving. Thank you for making our cities better. Thank you for taking your uh, your life and putting it into the public arena. It's always appreciated when people are doing it for the right reasons. And only after a half hour, I know you're doing it for the right reasons. So thank you so much for being part of our great country and our great uh, democracy that we have here in Canada. So th thank you. Well, thanks for inviting me on. It was really fantastic. And I'm really looking forward to meeting you in person at UBCM in September. It's certainly. So with that, <laughs> I want to remind everyone, put down your phones for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, helps our democracy, and it helps us be better people. We will be back tomorrow with our 600th episode. Until then, just keep talking. <laughs>